everyone. Thanks so much for having me here today. That was just a little video that I guess depicts um, the story of Project Futures, the people that we support, and I guess what we do all the way over here in order to support victims and survivors of human trafficking. Um, so I'm really excited to share my story today with you guys. Um, I know you've been sort of talking today about career and sort of you guys might be second, third, fourth year uni thinking, you know, what am I going to do? Will my degree actually equal or the job that I want to do equal what I want to do outside of that. Now, I did actually a Bachelor of International Communication at university. I went to Macquarie University, just um, sort of down the road from here. Um, I thought that I would be the CEO of an advertising agency by the time I was 30. I had no intention to actually ever work in the not-for-profit world. Um, I really loved marketing, strategy, brand. You know, I thought about how cool it would be to work in one of those advertising agencies with all those cool ping-pong machines and like, you know, pinball machines and all of that. But at 22 years old, I was actually asked a question. A friend of mine was working for a not-for-profit organisation and she basically said to me, Steph, do you want to cycle with me across Cambodia in order to raise funds and awareness for the charity that she was working for? And I said to her, I've never really raised funds before, like what does that entail? And she's like, I don't know, we can just fundraise together, we can create a couple of events, it'll be really fun, will you do it with me? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I will. So I kind of embraced it. I went off to Cambodia. Never been there before in my life. Loved it. We cycled 500 kilometres across the country and we both collectively raised, I think it was about $14,000 together just by doing events and fundraisers and stuff, asking my family and friends to donate. When I was in Cambodia, I picked up an amazing book and um, the book was about this woman. Her name is Somali Mam. Has anyone heard of Somali Mam before? A few people. So I picked up her book as a 22-year-old when I was cycling through Cambodia, read it from cover to cover, literally like in one day. I didn't put it down. And the story basically entailed her life as a child who was sold into prostitution at a really young age. And I guess growing up in Australia, in a, the really lucky country that I did, I was completely gobsmacked by what I had just read. Of course I knew that these horrible issues like rape, domestic violence, abuse, I know they existed, but you know, she just encapsulated it in her book in a way that just seemed so personal. It was like I was hearing her, I don't know, talk to me about what she'd been through, through this story that she told. And I was really uh, compelled by it and I thought to myself, I've just done this epic cycle challenge across Cambodia for, for a good cause in Australia, but what if I do the same one, gather some friends around me, I had a great time doing it, and so also to be able to support her organisation. So Somalia actually has three centres in Cambodia that rescue, rehabilitate and reintegrate women and children who have been forced into the sex trade over there. So I thought, why not? I'm going to embark on this sort of journey and do it. Now, I organised a cycle challenge um, when I came back from that first trip and I thought, it's going to be great. I'll get a couple of friends to join me. We didn't really have a goal. I just said, let's just fundraise some money and we can go on this same challenge, the same one that I did. A year later, we collectively raised $80,000 and 21 people joined me on this amazing cycle challenge across Cambodia. Now, that was pretty epic. I didn't think that we would have 21 people join. We didn't have a goal, but $80,000 seemed pretty amazing for, you know, 22, we were 23 years old at the time to be able to do this. So I thought, well, that was great. We went on this journey. I emailed the organisation over there to say to them, hey, you know, we've just raised $80,000, a bunch of Australians. Can I, you know, would it be okay if we came and actually saw where this money was going? And the most amazing thing about this journey was seeing the work that was done on the ground. So we actually got to visit, we were lucky enough to visit two centres in Cambodia that Somali Mum was running at that time and basically um, see how they took out literally young girls and women who had been sold against their will into the sex trade out of that be rehabilitated, be loved, be taught a skill or put through education and actually get a job at the end of that. It was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and so I came back to Australia and how do you think I felt when I came back from that experience, thinking that I would just sort of go back into the marketing world? Anyone? How do you think I felt? Empty? Was that empty? Yeah. Anyone else? 
Say that again. Touched, Touched absolutely. Enlightened. enlightened, absolutely. I was, I felt all these emotions sort of come through me, but more than anything, I had, I felt this burning in me, this burning desire to scream about this complete injustice that I saw. Here we are in Australia, this beautifully lucky country, which, you know, everyone here I'm sure absolutely loves. And we're surrounded by wealth and prosperity and, you know, great friends and people and we're able to go out on the weekends. At least that was my life over here. And I just come from this amazing journey where a lot of these women and young girls were just lucky to be, to be given a second chance. So I had this burning desire. To be honest, when I first organised the first trip, I thought that I would have, like, that was going to be my good deed for until I turned 30. So I was 22 at the time and I thought, that was my good deed. I raised $80,000 collectively, got 21 people together. What a great journey. I don't have to do anything until I'm 30, at least, for another charity. But when I came back from that experience, it was kind of different. I really had this burning frustration, but I also was inspired. I was also touched and I was enlightened. So my um, trajectory sort of changed. I was still in marketing comms and I utilised my skills and talents to create an organisation. So Project Futures is essentially a not-for-profit organisation. We raise awareness and funding to support anti-trafficking projects on the ground in places like Cambodia. We've supported Nepal and we also support a safe house right here in Australia, which is not far down the road from where you are right now, to support victims and survivors of trafficking. We were kind of like the marketing, comms, branding, awareness arm so that the people that are actually running the services and supporting these people can be funded to do their job. And it was an amazing experience. So Project Futures started, it was all about garnering young people as well. I was 23 at the time, you know, I didn't know any CEOs, I didn't know any really rich philanthropists, but I had a great group of young people and friends around me that I knew if we got them together, if we put them to work doing, you know, fun parties and getting the bike ride going again, we could make a real difference. So it was all about being resourceful and being different. We did the bike ride every single year. We went from one bike ride a year. This year we've got four bike rides a year going. Um, we created really fun parties and events and a couple of people in this room I know can attest to our parties. They were just a lot of fun. We weren't charging $500 tickets to a charity ball. We were charging $40 at the door with drink included, which is what young people in Australia would spend. They'd spend way more than that on a Friday or a Saturday night. But the great thing was that all the profits and all the proceeds were actually going to a great cause. So you were like partying for a purpose essentially. Essentially. And we were getting people to use their resources. So you could have been a graphic designer. That video that you saw, we did not pay one cent for that. I had a friend who was a music composer who did the music. I had a friend who worked in comms and script writing to do the script with me. I had a friend who was in graphic design who helped me put that together. And we all had a great goal. We had a vision for something like that. And what came out was something even better because we had the skills, but we also had the passion to know what message we wanted to send. So that video has been shown to, I don't even want to know how many schools, corporates, community workplaces, and it's a way to be able to spread our message and to inspire people. And, you know, our events got bigger and bigger year on year. As I said, the bike rides, um, we did this really great campaign called Stella Fella, because this issue is one that affects so many women and girls. And we need more men to say, we're here, we know that violence against women is wrong, we will not condone paying for sexual services from a child. It's all about trying to get more men to stand up and be stellar fellas. Um, this campaign's grown year on year as well. So in the first two years, uh, two and a half years, we were run 100% voluntarily. Um, Literally, and I had friends at university, we were working full time in our own jobs and we had raised just under half a million dollars in that two years. And then I came on board in a three day a week paid position as we started to grow Project Futures. And we started to get corporate partners involved. It was, it was a phenomenal experience. And this was all by, remember, we were probably by this time only 24 and 25. So the trajectory of, I guess, my life changed in that I thought that I wanted to be the CEO of an advertising agency and, you know, tell people to buy Colgate versus McLean's or, you know, tell people to buy McDonald's instead of KFC. That's what I thought I wanted to do. But I actually am doing something way more purposeful, but I'm also using those skills that I got taught. So it's not a complete waste. And I know a lot of people say, you know, for-profit world is here. 
not-for-profit world is here. But I guess Project Futures meet somewhere in the middle because we know that anyone that tells you a charity and a for-profit, oh, they're, they're, they're different structures, you know, they're both completely different. They're actually not. They're the same. You still need all the legal work. You still need all the accounting stuff behind it. You still need great marketing, brand, graphic design, marketing, content. You need people to promote your message. And above all, you need, the, you need to be able to scale it in a way. So actually, working for a for-profit and working for a not-profit, not-for-profit, isn't that different. To be honest, for me, working in not-for-profit just means I'm using my skills for a purpose. Um, so there are a couple of things that I want to say just before we, I think there could be some question times, yeah, around, um, I guess, some lessons learnt. And hopefully you guys can um, take these key takeaways in, in your own life and in your own career. Embrace yes, guys. If I didn't embrace yes to that first charity challenge that my friend took me on, I wouldn't be on this path I am today. And it took me out of my comfort zone massively, but it was the best experience for it and I was better for it. 21 friends equaled $80,000 if I did not say yes to that first event that my friend said. Um, if you don't ask, you don't get. You are so under, people underestimate how many resources they have around them. With things like Facebook, Twitter, all this social media, you absolutely underestimate what you actually have around you and that network you have. So don't forget that if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, Next one. The norm is boring, challenge it. What I mean by this is we were, at that point, a young charity that was, I guess, um, growing through the fact that we had no paid workers. It was all voluntary. And at that time, I felt charity was something that was, a lot of people wanted to look to the philanthropists or look to the CEOs. To, and, and they thought that they made a difference when it came to charity work or anything because they had the money behind them. But as I said, in two years of running 100% voluntarily through parties and bike rides and fun stuff with young people, we were able to raise under half, just under half a million dollars, which was a pretty amazing feat. So challenge the norm. Sometimes the status quo needs a bit of a shake up. Um, and that's what I mean by challenging the norm. <laughs> Go into that for purpose space. Be authentic and always back yourself. There were definitely times throughout that time in my career where I felt like, am I actually doing the right thing? But if you're authentic and if you back yourself and you know deep down why you're doing what you're doing, then it will always go according to plan. And the last one is obviously follow your bliss, whatever that is. I mean, I would not be here standing before you six years after starting Project Futures and there are headaches and you know, things that, along the way, really hard challenges, that if I didn't follow my bliss, which was essentially the survivors and the people that we are working towards supporting, um, I wouldn't be standing here before you today. So thank you very much for taking the time out to hear my story. And I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'll be hanging around for a little bit later if anyone wants to chat. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. OK, so we've got five really quick questions that we can take? Who has a question? Over here. OK. I was, uh, hello. I was just wondering how a non-profit organization can financially sustain themselves. Themselves? Yeah. How a non-profit organization? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I hate the word non-profit. I've, I've always hated the word non-profit. We do make profit, but we give our profit away. So we don't give our profit to shareholders. We actually give our profit to beneficiaries. So I like to call it for purpose. We actually run exactly the same as a lot of businesses run. We raise money, obviously, and we raised quite a lot in that first two years without any staff. But then I guess we needed a way to be able to sustain ourselves and, you know, we needed um, to structure ourselves properly as a business. So I came on board in a paid position and you do still need to, I guess, pay, pay staff. Is that what you mean? Yeah. How do we pay staff? Okay. No, is that... <laughs> well, we pay... St it's the same. I mean, the funds that we do raise, there's a portion that does go to administration costs. Yep. Perfect. Next question is over here. Thank you for your wonderful presentation Thank and you. great initiative that uh, we saw on presentation on the video. Thanks. I would like to ask you one question is about uh, what's your initiatives uh, to end the sex trafficking in developing countries? In Most, developing countries? Yes. So in Cambodia, basically, it's a four-stage process. There's recovery, so it's obviously getting people out of those situations and giving them a, a safe place to stay, recovery in terms of accommodation, psychological support um, and care. Then there's training and education, so they, they're taught a skill or they're put into educational facilities like school or high school, depending on their, um, 
I guess, depending on their capacity to be able to do that and what grade level they're at. Then there's reintegration. So they have to then go out into the community and actually use those skills and they're supported by a reintegration team that helps them um, get jobs or utilise their skill to create their own business. And then the fourth one, the last pillar, which is what we, you want everyone to get to is self-independence, where they don't rely anymore on the, the reintegration team or the ongoing support, and they're actually self-sufficient. So it is a four-stage process, and it's hard, and it takes a long time, but it, it works, and I've seen it work in action. Sorry? One question only. Okay, next one. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> okay, next question over here. Thank you for sharing, uh, sharing such a good story with us. Um, Thank you. When you do, uh, when you fundraising in Cambodia, and because I, I really like cycling, and yes. if you are fundraising um, the money for the charity, what sort of questions will you ask me? If um, you, if you were fun, oh, if you if, were fundraising if, and you asked me, yeah. Um, I'd ask you where it was going and if you couldn't answer that and if you've done your research on where that money is going, which yeah. is on our website and, and you have to do the research yourself as well, but we obviously yeah. have the tools to do that. You have to know, anyone that's fundraising has to know where the money's going. They have to know those four stages, they have to know the financials of the organisation. And any charity that anyone supports, you have, to have, you have to be able to have access to their annual reports, their financials, and you have to be able to have access to understand how that money's being spent. But that is something that's a self-education. You have to educate yourself based on the charity that you support, whatever it is. So when you go online on our website, you can actually download an impact report which showcases how our money is being spent and what it actually achieves. You can download our annual reports which showcase our financials, how much we raise, how much we spend, how much we give. Um, and you know, you have to be transparent at the end of the day. So um, I would say if you know where the money is going and um, you've done your research on that which should be available to you, then I, I think that your friends and family should be, would be happy to to, to donate to you or to donate to what you're doing. Thank awesome. you very much. So thanks very much Thank to you. Steph Lorenzo for being awesome. <laughs>